Good evening, everyone. My name is Piers MacDonald, and I would like to explore the subject of the evolution of public and First Nation self-governance in the North and suggest that it is time for governments to work together in a more integrated way and to synchronize their activities. Those of you from outside the North may not realize that public self-governance or responsible public government came late to the territories and in fact was not truly realized in the Yukon until the 1970s. Our legislature became paramount with elected MLAs and a cabinet with real authority only in 1978. Prior to this, the important decisions were made by a surrogate of a federal minister, the commissioner, and much of what the legislature did was in an advisory capacity. First Nation self-government, itself an inherent Aboriginal right, was recognized and funded by the federal government only in the early 1990s as part of the First Nation final agreements or the major, major treaty arrangements between Canada and Yukon First Nations. It was only then that First Nation government structures beyond chiefs and councils and the programs they managed were formed, laws were passed, decisions about program design were made within the First Nations themselves. These moves to public and First Nation self-governance were made in part to encourage more efficient decision-making and encourage decisions to be made more sensitive to the needs and spirit of Northern people. For federal authorities and Northerners alike, it was a political coming of age, a coming of age with huge implications for the well-being of Yukon people and the economic health of Northern communities. Now, you might be tempted to think that Northern people would be eager to work together and make the best use of limited resources. While some did think this way, and regarded the land claims as a kind of a marriage settlement, as uh, Judy has mentioned, where partners would share responsibilities and resources to their mutual advantage. Many others, however, saw the land claim agreements as a divorce settlement, where parties would go their own way, do their own thing, follow their own distinct visions of the future. And if you're closely watching the evolution of the Yukon government, you wouldn't have noticed much change before and after the signing of the First Nation final agreements, um, other than that there was a one-stop shop for Aboriginal relations and there were more, hire, more lawyers hired in the Department of Justice. Now some will say that characterization of the Yukon government isn't fair and that there were pockets of inspired communication and common action between some departments and the newly formed First Nation governments. And in any case, reaching out from one government to the other did not come easily, nor at that point was it instinctive. Trust between governments had to be built Trust, trust takes time, it takes effort, and trust must be earned. The reality was that there were few deliberate, conscious attempts between public and First Nation governments to work together at an operational level. There were mostly heartfelt but inconsistent overtures between politicians to work together. However, these weren't sustained and often collapsed when difficult issues got out of control. While there has been a gradual improvement over the last 25 years, I think it's fair to say that the offers of the First Nation final agreements would have to say that it's been not been nearly enough. Now, I would suggest something that might be a little bit controversial. I don't think self-government agreements were designed to be successful without there being a significant amount of cooperation between governments, public and First Nation governments, and between First Nation governments themselves. By, by this I mean that without governments making serious attempts to look for efficient ways of delivering services, sometimes together, one couldn't realistically expect that there always would be resources available to duplicate services to satisfy the interests of the various governments. So what to do? How does public government and how do First Nation governments meet their obligation to provide services to their citizens? And how do they operate efficiently so they can direct limited resources to improve the economic vitality of northern communities? Surely, while much of the financial challenge coming from the First Nation final and self-government agreements is a federal responsibility, there's a clear obligation on the part of Northern governments to do what they can do to work together to keep costs down and provide efficient support for community enterprises. Surely they should collaborate, they should plan together, they should determine whether there are innovations in program delivery to make government more efficient. At a minimum, they should try to synchronize their activities. Leaders of government have to do more than meet together. The governments at all levels should explore ways to do their jobs more efficiently. And if that means they work together and sometimes share in the delivery of programs and services, then they should do just that. Now, one organization has taken these challenges to heart, the Yukon College, 
is reaching out to all corners of the territory and doing research about and instruction in indigenous self-governance. This is a critical support system for intergovernmental cooperation because they explore options in innovative governance modeling, they teach about best practices and program delivery, and discuss how the unique needs of northern Aboriginal communities can be met. Engaging in degree and postgraduate programs in this field is just one good reason to encourage their elevation to a small boutique university. This is a field of activity for which there is little experience elsewhere in the country from which people can draw. While the college transitions to a university, its challenge is to continue to meet its traditional mandates while stepping up to the plate and meeting the unique challenges that newly minted indigenous and public governments provide. So besides the college and Yukon University, I would have to say that the most innovative cooperative activities are practiced by the business community. As First Nation trusts look for new investments and First Nation development corporations seek out business opportunities, it has been the business community which has lost no time finding new projects. Together they look past the barriers and seek to build joint ventures that have famously been successful and central to Yukon's modern economy. Newly developed First Nation businesses include joint ventures with long-time Yukon businesses which have employed people throughout the territory and raised the standard of living for First Nation and Yukon citizens alike. In the last decade or so, it has been a success story like few others. Some of Yukon's institutions, Yukon College and the business community have risen and are rising to the challenges posed by a post-land claim era and have proven that cooperative action can make a world of difference to the lives and economic well-being of Yukon people. It is time for governments, First Nation and public, to prove that they can do the same and operate more efficiently, leaving citizens with more resources to build pro prosperity and meet their community needs. Thanks. <laughs>